What's on, ladies and gentlemen? My name's Ross, I like games, and today we're going to be looking at the top 10 discards from Age of Ascension. Now, just to be clear here, we are speaking only about the cards that were new in Age of Ascension. We are not talking about any of the Call of the Archons cards that were reprinted in Age of Ascension. As Barney might say, new is always better. We've already done Mars, I'll pop a link to that one in the description. We're going to be going through all the houses. As a side note, I did put a poll up on the Facebook group, the big one. Thank you to everyone that joined in and answered on the poll. I love you guys. Couple of honourable mentions before we get going. A couple which I think could have found their way onto the list but fell just a little bit short. Starting off with Onyx Knight. Now, Onyx Knight is... Well, you got Onyx Knight in Dis, and then Opal Knight in Sanctum, and they are very much the opposites of each other. And what it does, nice and simply, is it destroys every single creature on the board, yours and your opponents, with an odd number of power. Can hugely backfire, which is why it didn't make the list. Also, I want to give a shout out to Streak. Streak is kind of like the equivalent of Succubus for Wave 2. Succubus makes your opponent draw one fewer card to end their turn. Streak does that, but only if it's not on a flank. So it's still good, but it's not quite as good as Succubus. That downside is a big downside. And Silver Key Imp. I didn't actually put any of the Key Imps on the list. I was extremely close to putting Silver Key Imp on the list. The Key Imps basically stop both players forging a particular key. Silver is the one that stops either player forging their second key. They can be extremely useful, but they can also be really awkward to play around. They're good cards, but I think at the end of the day, they weren't quite always successful enough to make me want to put them on the list. So, coming in at number 10, we've got Yurk. Now, I know that Old Yurk and Ancient Yurk are also cards in the set. I don't think Old Yurk and Ancient Yurk are as good. I think Yurk is a superior one. And basically, when you play it, you discard a card from your hand. As opposed to Old Yurk where you discard two and Ancient Yurk where you discard three. And discarding cards from your hand is good. It means at the end of your turn, you draw more cards because you've got fewer cards in hand. It means you can put them into the discard pile so that you can reuse them with something like an Exhume. And spoiler alert, that one's coming a bit higher up on the list. But a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, discarding one is like, cool. And discarding more than one, especially going up to three, can be a little bit like, oh, that's, that's more than I was willing to discard. In at number 9, we've got Misery Exploit. It is an action card that gains you one amber for each damaged enemy creature. Now, the reason this doesn't get higher up on the list is because it is rather situational. If you've been able to play something like a Throwing Stars the previous turn, that's going to be amazing. If they've got more than three creatures and you've played a Whistling Darts the previous turn, that's going to be even more amazinger. But if you're not doing a bunch of cheeky damage, etc. in your deck, it might not be as good. Situational, like a bunch of cards that didn't make the list. But the upside of it working is so huge, I had to put it in at number 9. In at number 8, Ortanu the Chained. One of the... I don't know, almost like one of the chase cards in Age of Ascension. One of those rares that has a special rare that comes along with it. Ortanu's Binding. To take a look at Ortanu the Chained, when you reap, you return each copy of Ortanu's Binding from your discard pile to your hand, and for each one returned this way, deal 2 damage to a creature with 2 damage splash, that is to say 2 damage to each of its neighbours. And it's a 7 power creature with no downside when you play it, it's extremely powerful. Now Ortanu's Binding is not quite as beneficial. Good news is you do get an amber bonus. Bad news, you've got to deal two damage to a friendly creature. But the damage you're doing with Ortanu far outweighs the damage you're doing to yourself with his binding. It's one of the best ways to cause cheeky damage in a disc deck, and I love it. In at number seven, not finished with you. It gives you an amber bonus, which is lovely. 
and it lets you shuffle any number of creatures from your discard pile into your deck. It means you can reuse brilliant stuff like Helper Bot, which has gone and been destroyed and gotten back. Or maybe you're lucky enough to have an Ember Imp as a legacy card. You can get it back. And the great thing here is that you can wait until your deck is quite small, shuffle back the creatures that you want, and then you're probably going to draw into them fairly quickly. In at number six, we've got Anguish. A card which I find difficult to pronounce because it's kind of weird. Now, it's a six power creature which is moderately powerful. But for each damage on Anguish, your opponent's keys cost plus one Amber. And your opponent can always just take it out. But not immediately. So let's say for argument's sake you play it and then you play on Ortanu's Binding. Now your opponent's keys cost plus two. You can play it down. And then immediately damage it because it doesn't matter whether it's exhausted. And then your opponent's keys cost more at the beginning of their turn. And sure, as soon as their turn begins, they can then knock out Anguish. That's fine. But you still stopped them forging a key. You still put them in a position where they can't forge. You slowed them down by a turn. And that's assuming they can immediately destroy Anguish. There'll be some games, not that many unfortunately, but there will be some games where you can... Just stop your opponent forging for multiple turns. In at number five, Unlocked Gateway. Unlocked Gateway is a brilliant, though extreme, card. It's got the new Omega keyword, which means that it must be the last card you play, the last thing you do during your doing stuff step. No more playing, no more using, no more discarding. It destroys each creature. The reason it's got Omega is so that you cannot play a bunch of creatures after Unlocked Gateway. Any you play down this turn will be destroyed. But then you can always use stuff like Exhume to bring those cards back. We literally saw the Birmingham Regional 1 by somebody playing Charette from an Exhume after playing an unlocked gateway to stop their opponent forging. Plus, if your opponent's got a really big battle line and you don't, go for it, ladies and gentlemen. Go for it. And because it's an Omega card, you don't even have to take any chains. In at number four, we've got Tesmal. Tesmal is extremely powerful. Now, it's a two-power creature with Elusive, but it means your opponent can just take it out before you ever actually use it. They'll have a turn to do so. Unless you've got a Dusk Witch, which again will probably be taken out before you ever actually get to use it. Uh, I've played Dusk Witch so many times and it's lasted long enough to use it once. But Tesmal then has got a really nice Reap ability. Choose a house. Your opponent cannot choose that house as their active house on their next turn. Kind of like Restoring Guntus, but as a Reap ability. And as I did show you in a previous video, it will not appear with Restoring Guntus, and it is limited to two per deck, which is important so you can't just lock your opponent out of the game right at the beginning. Still, you're locking them out of a house, that's pretty gosh darned awesome. You look at their board and they've got five creatures ready to reap, lock them out of that house. You look at their discard and realise they're going to have more Mars cars than anything else, lock them out of that house. You're particularly worried about your opponent going shadows, playing stuff like Miasma or just stealing all your amber, lock them out of shadows. In at number three, speaking of shadows, we've got Shadow of Dis. Gives you an amber bonus, and until your next turn, enemy creatures' tech boxes are considered blank, except for traits. You turn off all of your opponent's skills. Think of all the things we've seen so far that you're turning off. Streak, oh no wait, I can draw until I've got six cards in hand. Brilliant. And it is until the end of your opponent's turn, so they can play an Onyx Knight, but they're not able to destroy your creatures they can play a yerk but they're not able to discard a card from their hand they can play a helper bot but they can't play a non-logos card etc it's not always going to be amazing but most of the time it will be there will be so many turns where you're stopping your opponent doing five or six things because it's all the cards that they're playing with their play skills and all the skills of the creatures they've already got out it's pretty brutal in at number two, Binding Irons, a card which 
really in a lot of houses would deserve to be number one. You probably guessed what number one is already and it is a clear number one. Binding irons, you just put three chains on your opponent. We've not seen any other cars that chain your opponent. I mean, I've told you how good Streak and Succubus are. They stop you drawing a card at the end of your turn, but they can be removed. Whereas Binding Irons, you give them free chains. Which is, most of the time, unless you've already got a lot of chains, it's free turns of drawing one fewer card. But you lock them in. And then there's nothing they can do about it. They can't just destroy a creature and get it back. Because it's already happened. It's so good, it's actually limited to two per deck. I went through this in the video as well. I'll link that video in the description. Such a good card, you can only have two of them. It's also unique, and frankly, we've all seen it. You go to chain-bound tournaments. You've got a really good deck. You keep winning. Then you pick up chains. And you get to a point where there's so many chains on your deck, you stop winning, give up, and play a different deck. Which, incidentally, is the entire point of chain-bound tournaments. Win until it gets too awkward to win, then play with a new deck. They do it deliberately. They want you to play new decks. Well, this is just as good. It's redonk, ladies and gentlemen. It's absolutely redonk. But in at number one, you've probably guessed already, it's Exhume. Exhume is one of those over-the-top broken cards which you're just going to see winning games over and over again. It gives you an amber bonus, which I could argue is overkill, but I'm cool with it. When you play it, you choose a creature in your discard. You may play that creature as if it belonged to the active house and was in your hand. My personal favourite combo, and I do have this in my Time Traveller Double Binding Irons deck. I made a video on it, I'll link it in the description. You use Exhume to get yourself back a Halperbot. You play Halperbot, and then you get to play a card from your third house, and you get to use all three houses in one turn. That's wonderful. But I told you how the Birmingham winner used Unlocked Gateway and then played Exhume to reuse Charette. Charette captures free amber when you play it, but when it's on the field, it's kind of there and it's just a four power creature that doesn't do anything. But if you can destroy it and then play it to capture free amber, that's pretty gosh darn good. There are so many combos with Exhume. It's house cheating, it's playing extra creatures, it's wonderful. One question that has come up over the past few days does that mean if you've got a Dusk Witch out so that all your creatures enter play ready, you can use them straight away? I'm fairly sure the answer is no, because it doesn't mean that the creature you play is in the active house. It means you play it as if it belonged to the active house. So to use Halperbot as an example, you can play Halperbot as if it was a disc creature, and then you get to play a non-Logos card. But you then aren't allowed to reap with Halperbot because Halperbot isn't in the House of Dis. I'm sure we'll get a confirmation on this in the near future. But Exhume is number one, and I did a poll over on the Facebook group, as previously mentioned, and it wasn't even close. Like, Binding Irons got 25 votes, and Exhume got 185. People love Exhume, and there's a pretty gosh darn good reason for it. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the best cards in this from Age of Ascension. But you might have some arguments. You might have some disagreements. Oh, look. There's a comment section. So please tell me what you think. And I would be extremely grateful if you would leave a full top 10 list in the comment section. Go nuts. Be nice. And then make sure you like this video. Subscribe to this channel because I'm going to be doing five more videos on the other five houses. You want to see them, right? And then follow me on Twitter at the Wossy, where we talk Keyforge and a whole bunch of other games. But by far the most important thing, as always, look after yourselves till next time. Thank you very much for watching. My name's Ross, and you've been watching Wossy Plays.